where we left off last week was talking about how dealing with teleology a little bit more, our ultimate goal in life and our ultimate desire in life, and how though what we love drives who we are and what we do, more so than what we think. And we began to touch on the notion that our ultimate love is oriented by and by and to a picture of what we think it looks like for us to live well. What we want out of life is, it is focused on our idea of what a good life looks like when you actually get a chance to entertain it. We'll deal next week and sometimes with the fact that you may have an idea of a good life but you just don't really feel like life affords you the opportunity to pursue it and how that relates to spirituality and walking with God and Him opening doors and making ways and the relationship and the dynamics that are at play with that. But we talked about and worked very heavily on the fact that many of the ultimate decisions and actions and paths we undertake are implicitly and ultimately aimed at trying to live out the vision of the good life that we love and thus want to pursue. Most self-destructive activities such as substance abuse, remaining in abusive relationships, aligning themselves with gangs, financial recklessness, eating disorders, we talked about the idea that a lot of behavior that we can look at and see as self-destructive is ultimately in one shape or form either oriented towards avoiding pain or towards pursuing what a person perceives as a good life for the life that they've experienced. Last week we dealt with a passage from Matthew 6 as an example of the importance of deconstructing previously held images of the kingdom and imparting more accurate pictures of the kingdom through our imagination in order to address self-destructive behavior. So let me slow down, bring everybody back because I'm a little bit wired. That happens when I play sometimes. People engage in self-destructive behavior. We wonder what in the world they're thinking about. And we talked about the idea that from their upbringing and from their environment and from their culture and from their life's interactions, they form a picture of the good life that may be entirely different than ours. Yes. We may have a completely different vision of what a good life looks like than somebody who grows up in a drug addicted family or who grows up with a silver spoon in their mouth. Those ranges create images and sometimes self-destructive behaviors are aimed at trying to achieve good life, whether it's cheating on Wall Street, running yourself into a hole on, at a gambling table, or running the streets on drugs, you're trying to achieve what your environment has instilled in you as a good life. And we talked about the idea that it is something that is instilled, and we'll get there in a second, I'm mean, gonna get ahead of myself, but we dealt with Matthew 6, where it talks about not allowing, don't store up your treasures on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where their lives or where thieves break and steal but store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust can't destroy them and thieves do not break and, and instill. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart also will be. And we use several more verses talking about the fact and using as an illustration the idea that Jesus in his teaching had to break down people's ideas of what they, they thought the kingdom was about in order to instill in their imaginations ideas of what the kingdom actually was. And whenever you deal, find somebody in a self-destructive pattern, one of the things we talk, a lot of people just want to teach you 10, 12 steps, platitudes, and behavior changes. Well, realistically, one of the most important things and one of the least dealt with things is what they think a good life looks like. They shape themselves around an idea of what a good life looks like and pursue that and you have to break it down and deconstruct that and then instill in them according to scripture what a good life actually looks like or even sometimes just according to society and according to healthy living what a good life actually looks like. So we use these verses as an example where Jesus talks about not worrying about material stuff, not worrying about that the people who have aren't necessarily the most righteous and the people that don't have aren't necessarily the most sinful. But we got to, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever our teleos is, so will the desires of our heart and consequently the impetus of our actions be found. We are born into a variety of contexts that impart their ideas of the good life into our cardia in very subtle and quiet ways. When you're born, as an example, when we're, we talked about when you're born, you're born into a social culture. You are born into a familiar culture. You're born into an income culture. You're born into all of these different environments, and when you put them all together, 
it shapes what we think of as the good life. And that living life imparts these things to you. And one of the models that we used was, and we're gonna revisit, is the shopping mall as a mechanism in, under which an idea of a good life is imparted and our actions and our practices drive or become driven to that end. There are three things uh, that we'll focus on, and one of them we dealt with somewhat last week but didn't really have time to get into it, and then a couple of other things that we're gonna talk about when you're dealing with the shopping mall. Three things that the advertising and consumeristic experience that is our culture drive into our minds and how it shapes our good life. They impart three ideas. The first one is I'm broken, therefore I shop. <laughs> or I'm broke, therefore I shop. Given the smiling faces that look at us from beer commercials and the wealthy people who populate sitcoms and, cons and reality shows, we're sometimes prone to supposing that the culture of consumerism is that of unbridled optimism looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. But this misses an important element of the mall's rituals and its advertising, its own construal of the brokenness of the world, which issues not in confession but in consumption. One might say that this is the mall's superficial equivalent of sin. The point is this, implicit in advertising, implicit in the icons, the mannequins, and the stick figures, and all in, in the icons of success, happiness, pleasure, and fulfillment, is a stabbing, albeit unarticulated, recognition that this is not me. When we see the people playing the most advanced video game systems on the largest television screens imaginable or entire walls, and we're stuck playing on a little 29 inch, <laughs> that trying to see people this big, and I'm getting older and my eyes are not getting better, and trying to shoot stuff that's, and we realize I don't have that. What would it be like to have that? When we look at what the latest clothes are supposed to be, when we see the fashion, high fashion, or what, whatever we happen to find in Real Housewives or whatever, and, and all of these shows and all of the Jenners and the Kardashians and the magazines and all this stuff, there is a difference between what they have and what we have, what they wear, what they can afford to spend on what they wear and what we wear. And implicit in the advertising is that I don't have that. I'm not there. Everything, I see images on billboards or on Facebook or sitcoms, and while it's never said, an implicit recognition seeps into my adaptive unconsciousness. Everything seems to work out for these people. Their life isn't without struggles, but, but by the end of the show, they seem to be enjoying family and friends helping them overcome their adversity. And they sure have nice stuff to go along with. And we talked about minivans and big screen TVs and barbecues and what we see these things and these images of what it looks like to relax in a man cave. What it looks like, the car commercials. I've been driving a Lincoln since before I was paid to drive a Lincoln. How nice and serene it is and how much conviction he has in his voice. And I would love to actually be able to just sit back and be on an open road and not have any problems and, or BMW. We can, I, was paid to, I was driving a BMW before I got paid to drive a BMW. <laughs> and it creates images. I wish I had it, which means I don't. And sometimes I can't have it because I'm not there yet. And so the advertising and the marketing and everything that gets you into the mall, and when you actually get into the mall, the, the mannequins and the pictures, the big pictures of people that look happy with these clothes on, create an image and idea, but that's not me. Their images of happiness and fulfillment and pleasure are insinuating that this isn't you, and you know it, so do we. Whatever is covertly communicated to us, what is covertly communicated to us is the disconnect and difference between their lives and our own, which often don't look or feel nearly as fulfilled as these images do. On one hand, those ideals draw on the power of authentic human desire for friendship, joy, love, and play. On the other hand, they also tend to implant and exaggerate less laudable ideals focusing on particular concepts of eternal, external beauty that are culturally relative and often impossible to achieve, being the products of digital manipulation. Supposedly, the ideal body type that can only be achieved artificially and are meant to impress upon us a deep sense of lack, thereby engendering a powerful sense of need that would otherwise be absent. But we look at these magazine covers. You walk through the grocery store and they're all over the place. And how many of these women have been photoshopped, airbrushed? You have skinny people getting shrunk. 
and touched up. Skinny people being shrunk and touched up to portray an idea of what an ideal body type looks like. So that way the rest of us know we don't look like that. It's part of, I'm broken, therefore I shop. We don't look like this, but if we could, we could be happy. If I could take the diet products, if I could get the zip cream, if I could get myself a, I would be popular, people would like me, champagne would fall from the sky, people would give me money just because I look so good, and my life would be so much simpler. That's the advertising, that's the marketing, that's creating an idea of what a good life looks like to us. The other thing is that the mall and the shopping and consumerism creates a strange configuration of sociality. Or to make it much more simpler, you have haterism that emerges as a result of commercial, commercialized culture. Because of its emphasis on ideals of image and because we are immersed in such ideas almost everywhere, these ideas slowly sleep, seep into our fundamental way of perceiving the world. Most people go to the mall with friends. I don't because I want to get in and get out. But most people want to find somebody to go to the mall with them. And as you, are in the, as, we, as you are in the mall, something happens while you're out with your friends and you're walking around. There's something interesting that takes place oftentimes. As a result of it seeping into our, the way we perceive the world, we not only judge ourselves against the standard of commercialization, but we fall into the habit of evaluating other people by the same standards. For example, if we could somehow analyze ourselves as a friend or a friend of a friend approaches our circle, we go to a mall group and somebody comes up to us. If we could analyze what's happening as we notice them for the first time, we might find ourselves looking him or her up and down, noticing the clothes that they seem that seem to be in the wrong place, what cell phone they happen to carry that was two years that's two years old, listening to music that nobody listens to anymore from a part of town that we wouldn't go into with a police escort. Instantaneously, as I walk towards the group, we start sizing them up. There's a tendency to do it. Now, some of us think we're more mature than that. Of course, we'll get off in our corners and talk with our mates and significant others. Then we say stuff that we wouldn't say in common public, and then our, our wife tells us to shut up. Um, but you size people up. You see stuff. What shoes are they wearing? What pants are they wearing? How do they fit? What phone is it? How old is the phone? What music? There's all of these things that start to happen as we evaluate these people according to what society and the advertising tells us is normative or is to be expected. Or while we sit in the food court, women might find their eyes constantly darting to watch the other girls and women pass by. In the big blink of an eye, we find that we've sized them up from top to bottom, notice their hair and sandals, wordlessly scorn their ugly makeup and chubby ankles, or silently admired, even craved their Dolce and Gabbani sunglasses and naturally wavy hair. Really? <laughs> it happens. I'm, or am I making this up? No, I do that all the time. I can't. <laughs> you see, what, what were they thinking about when they walked up the house looking like that today? <laughs> am I, 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 maybe I'm just talking about myself. No. About myself. <laughs> you, you see people, you think. They come, they come into school, they should have known better than walking the building looking like that. They're about to have a real bad day. <laughs> well, I know maybe this is the most Christian approach to the things, but this is how. Yeah. Life and there are those of us who spent our lives on the outside, having to say we don't care because this is what we got, or this is what our parents could afford, or whatever it is, or this is just what I want to wear, and all the rest of y'all can go kick rocks. So there's that dichotomy that even those of us who say go kick rocks will do the exact same thing at some point in time. It's natural because we've been enculturated to a standard of what a good life looks like, what success looks like, and what happiness looks like, and these people don't fit. We've, about, we've just implicitly evaluated other people against ourselves, then triangulated this against the ideas we've absorbed from the mall's evangelism. In doing so, we've kept a running score in our head. Either we've congratulated ourselves on having won this comp particular comparison, or we're demoralized into realizing that once again we don't me me measure up. Subtly then, we've constructed our relationship largely in terms of a competition against one another, against the icons of the ideal that have been painted for us, and in the process we've also objectified others. We have turned them into artifacts for observation and evaluation. Things to be looked at, and by playing this game we've turned ourselves into an object as well. Evaluating others based on our success at being objects, I'm sorry, in both ways 
The sociality of the mall, bustling with people, is merely a cover for a construal of human inner subjectivity as fundamentally competitive and reductionist. That's a lot of stuff going on just for a trip to the mall. But this is human nature, it's human tendency. And so the point of this is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Asking ourselves, my idea of a good life, is it my own or is it something that was given to me? Did I actually sit and work this out and this is what I think is a good life? Or am I living somebody else's dreams and fantasies? It, especially when we talk about how powerful and important your idea of a good life is. And we spent two or three lessons discussing that and how it affects your imagination and how it affects your spirituality. Does my idea of what a good life is, is that actually mine? Or did it come from someplace else? The third thing that we pick up when we go to the mall, I shop, therefore I am. I shop, therefore I am. If the icons of the ideal subtly impress upon us what's wrong, where we fail, then the marketing lit market's liturgies are really an invitation to fix the problem. Through its stories and images, or though its stories and images point out to us our blotches and blemishes, 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 they are not pessimistic. To the contrary, they hold out a sort of redemption in the goods and services that market the, prospect, the market provides. The mall holds out to us consumption as a means of redemption in two senses. In one sense, the shopping itself is construed as a kind of therapy, a healing activity, a way of dealing with the sadness and frustrations of our broken world. There are some people for which going shopping is therapy for whatever it is that's gone wrong in their life. I'm going to go shopping, I'm going to find me something, and it's going to make me feel better about the world. And what they're looking for comes from what they've been told they're supposed to look for. I'm going to look at electronics because I get a nice happy buzz when I get a new toy. I'm going to look for video games. I'm going to look for a new pair. I'm going to find me a new pair of shoes. You know what? I've had a hard week. I'm going to find me a dress. I'm going to find me some shoes that match it. I'm going to get jewelry. And I'm putting this stuff on and I'm going out. Shopping is therapy, retail therapy. They literally call it retail therapy. The um, the mall offers us a sanctuary and a respite where we can count on sales clerks greeting us with friendly sm smiles, where we can lose ourselves in the labyrinth of the racks and find new delights and surprises that at least for the time cover, up over, cover over the doldrums of our workday existence. Think of it, you go to the mall, you expect to be treated nicely, you expect to be treated respectfully. We get indignant when we find somebody who acts like they don't care because there's a certain assumed interaction I'm not supposed to have to deal with the same stupid stuff in the mall as I deal with other people when I go on my job. It's their job to be nice to me. Isn't it? That's exactly, and we expect it. And so we go to the mall expecting a different kind of social interaction. It's kind of like the way we go to church expecting a different kind of social interaction, but we'll get there. And this is America's religion. This is what, it's, when we talk about liturgy, when we talk about religious experiences, it's not all just confined to the church. We have ritualistic practices, things that we do habitually, interacting with the world, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's all right. Things that we do that infuse us with an idea of what a good life is supposed to be, and how we're supposed to experience the world, and what it's supposed to be like. So the very act of shopping is idealized as a means of redemption. First point, I'm broken, therefore I shop. Third point, I shop, therefore I am. I go to shop to fix what's wrong with me or at least make me feel better about the world and experience, hopefully by the time I get done experience some escapism that makes me feel better about myself. In another sense, the goal of shopping is the acquisition of goods and the enjoyment of services that try to address the problem, what's wrong with us, our pear-shaped figure, our pimply face, our drabbed outside wardrobe, our rusting old car, and so forth. To shop is to seek and find. We come with a sense of need, it sounds like an altar call, we come with a sense of need given our failures to measure up to its iconic ideals, and the mall promises something to address that. The narratives of the mall's outreach, the, vener the venerable stained glass presentation of the happy life, implant us with the desire to find that version of the kingdom, the good life which requires acquisition of all the stuff in order to secure the ideal and combat our failures. Y'all didn't know that this much stuff was being driven in your heads when you went shopping. But it's, it's, it's kind of, this is where we live and this is what happens with us a lot of times. But here's the very little secret dealing with the mall and the shopping. 
which we get animations of but are encouraged to forget. When the shopping excursion is over and all the bags are brought back to the house as the spoils are our adventure, we find that we've come back with the same old real world we left. Kind of like church service. <laughs> I'm just saying that there's, there's a very good parallel between this, and we don't look at them the same way. The thrill of the shopping experience is over. I shouted, I got my warm, let me get off the train. The thrill of this, it's much safer over in the shopping mall. The thrill of the shopping experience is over, and now we have to do our homework, cut the grass, wash the dishes. Well, when can we go back again to the mall again? That was more fun. And while the new product has glitz and fascination about it for a little while, we know, but hate to admit, that the dazzle fades rather quickly. The new jacket we couldn't wait to wear to school somehow is dingy in just a couple of months or less. The greatest and latest cell phone that seemed to have everything is blowing up in my pocket three minutes later after I get it and subjected to a massive recall. Or, yeah, because I want, or there's a new phone that comes coming out six months later that's gonna have something else that the last one didn't, and so I gotta go get that one. I was excited about this one until I find out another one was coming. With the letter S on it. Uh, with the letter S on Yeah, there's the phone and then there's the phone S. And I had the one, and now i got to go get the S version. Because the S version, it's not as new anymore. All of a sudden, I'm getting irritated because my phone that I was excited to have isn't quite active perfectly after I've dropped it and thrown it into a wall and kicked yeah. it around. And, it, and it's not working quite the way it was, and now i got to have this new one. The video game that we just had to have, is sitting around unplayed after a couple weeks because we've already beat every level and found out it was too difficult for us to play and just set it aside. In short, what sparks the thrill of the new is the mall slanted light, and the mall slanted light quickly becomes flat and chill. It's not working anymore. I'm not getting a bus with no shoes anymore. That's why some people have totes, like bigger than these amplifiers, Loaded up with. I'm just talking. I said some people. I said yeah. the biggest those <laughs> filled up with shoes with two pair of feet. On the other hand, I got like eight guitars so and two hands. So I'm not one. But it happens. Of course, I can justify every single guitar I have. Let's move on. Uh, this yes. is why the mall's liturgy is not just a practice of acquisitions but a practice of consumption. Its quasi redemption lives off of two ephemeral elements. The first is the thrill of an unsustainable experience or event and the sheen of the novel and the new. Both of these are, the, are subject to a law of diminishing returns and neither can last. They both slip away requiring new experiences and new acquisitions. In other words, that's how they keep you coming back. That's how they keep you spending money. Not because the stuff breaks down but because, for some of us, but now some of us, I'll ride a car till the wheels fall off. That's the way that I'm wired. On the other hand, I have Never mind. Um, there's just stuff that all of us find. It's a new amp coming out. I got to go check this out. It's a new board coming out. I got the Motif 8, but it's a Motif 9 coming out. I got to see what that thing can do. And when I find out what that does, the Motif ain't just ain't it yet. And if I have the money to spend it out, I'm going to find myself, and sometimes even if I don't, I'm going to find myself wondering what in the world did I just do. <laughs> and then there are the bargain shoppers. I was going to put this in here, but you didn't have time, but since you brought it up. Yeah. Some people get their buzz finding their stuff 75, 80, 90% off. And that is wonderful. And it's a much more affordable experience. <laughs> but it's not when you get all the coupons and you spend the exact same amount that you would have spent on a whole bunch of stuff. If yeah, but you get more for the same amount of money. Yeah, but you spend yeah, all that time in there, and you about to go back. The next I time. get it, you get it, but I'm just saying that there are different people who have different modes of wiring. Yeah. Six, yeah. Six, five, five, six. So the, at the end of the day, the, the buzz comes from the experience, not even necessarily the acquisitions, because sometimes we don't even need stuff. Yeah. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Okay. But we get a buzz because I just saved 80% on these yeah. shoes that are my 30th pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. And just have the same exact pair of shoes, just slightly older than us. All right. Or this, no, this one has a different heel on it. <laughs> it's a little bit more narrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord, that's all in somebody that's just, that's I think side. justification <laughs> is the problem. <laughs> well, justification is a problem. Rationalization is a problem. But the reason we justify and rationalize these things is because we have an idea that this is what a good life is. 
This was fun. This got me away from my problems. This got me away from the world and got me into what I thought would. If I if I had my way about it, I'd go through shopping all day long. But I got to go back out into the real world and deal with the real world stuff. Because we have acculturated something about what good living looks like. The byproduct of such persistent acquisition is a side we don't see or talk about very much, the necessity of disposing of the old and boring. So while the liturgy of the market invests products with an almost transcendent sheen and glow, enhancing them with the same kind of magic and pseudo grace, the fact is that the same liturgies encourage us to dispense with these products in a heartbeat. What the mall valorizes as sacred today will be profane and five minutes ago tomorrow. Hence comes the irony that consumerism, which we often denounce as materialism, is quite happy to reduce things to nothingness, which makes such serial acquisitions consumptive, which makes such serial acquisitions as consumptive, is just the treatment of things as disposal. On the one hand, this practice invests things with redemptive promise. On the other hand, they can never measure up to that, and so must they must be discarded for new things that hold up the same unsustainable promise. By our immersion of this liturgy of consumption, we are being trained to both overvalue and undervalue things. Let me say that again, because that's hugely practical. By our immersion in this liturgy of consumption, we are trained to overvalue and undervalue things. The gotta have it, you really don't just have to have. And the stuff that you think is, are, is too old to use, probably use a little bit longer. We are trained to overvalue and undervalue things. We're trying to invest them with a meaning and significance as objects of love and desire in which we place disproportionate hopes. We're hoping to enjoy them rather than simply hoping to use them, while at the same time treating them as easily discarded. So that brand new car that had all the bells and whistles and all the toys that I wanted and all the interactions, when I get that car payment, we wonder, did I really need this? And when the warranty wears off, Mm -hmm. What was I thinking about when I bought this piece of junk? Overvalue. And we thought we had arrived when we got that thing. What? Look at me. Yeah, the car. The, the BMW. Huh? I think you should just pay for the warranty. You can pay for it. Eventually, the warranty gonna wear out. Or the manufacturer's not gonna try to is gonna try to skate out of it. Fine, fine. There's hassles and headaches. Right. And why didn't I just keep that old beater that I had and didn't have any problems? When, when I had the old beer, I was wondering why I got to keep dealing with this stupid thing and put money into it. Mm -hmm. But we feel good. We feel like our problems are gone because we just drove off in a brand new car. No, nope. zero, zero, zero on. Wow, never done this before. And then it hits a thousand miles. It's time for me to get something else. It's old now. So, any questions or comments? The new car, yeah, I want a bottle of new car smell and I have yet to find it or get it because I forget about it. But yes, give me a new car smell and I will be happy the rest of my life. Amen. Questions or comments? I'm actually looking for a new car smell. Okay. I'll talk to you about that new car smell, about some of the what they use to make that odor. It's really interesting. I read Don't ruin it for me. Oh, no, no. Don't too much stuff. This young, young man right here. Uh, but, uh, something else, I've noticed within the last two to three, maybe three to four years, a lot more advertisements have been coming out for plastic surgery. Now, they don't call it that. They call it uh, magic lift or something like that. Where, yeah. and, but it's all, really, it's all plastic surgery. And right. the deal before was that exactly. if you said that, they said, well, you know, this is something for stars and that. And now right. these people are doing the same thing. And teeth, too, the same thing. You might not even necessarily have anything wrong with your teeth like I have a crooked one down here but there's but no cavities or anything mm -hmm. they might say well we can get you perfect set we can do implants dental implants mm -hmm. yeah or we can do whitening strips for you yeah. and and you know you do the tissue test like you take the tissue the white tissue yeah oh my so but what they don't tell you that tissue is so blazingly white that even when you use the whitening strip it still makes the whitening look dull mm -hmm. uh, they don't tell you that part <laughs> But all this, especially about the plastic surgery, mm. I've noticed a big thing on that where, and that's something because that used to be stuff that, boy, that's something you just, it's not practical, you really can't afford it. But now, they're, it's, they're mass marketing, they're targeting yeah, you this. you make payments now. Right, you make payments and everything, <laughs> and so it falls right along with this. 
that, uh, and then you see some of the celebrities that could afford it, and, and they really look really bad. Some of them have gone too far with some of this stuff. And they keep on going back, and pretty soon they, they look, it's really sad because they look grotesque instead of enhanced. But that's all yeah. part of this. And you see it on TV shows where, and, every now, and I believe that there's some truth in advertising or in, in fiction. Somebody who thinks that they're perfectly fine will walk into a plastic surgeon clinic for whatever reason. And they'll say, have you ever thought about having this done? Have you ever thought about having your, your, your nose worked done? What's wrong with my nose? You thought your nose was perfectly fine before, but they find something wrong with it. I never noticed. Yeah, let's get that fixed. So, said all that, perhaps some of us will never look at going to the mall the same way again. But we took all this time to deal with a very simple routine thing that we've been doing our entire lives, not realizing where and what drives and what effect it has on <clears throat> some people. Now, the degree that it affects some people can be different. It may not be as big for you as you've got something else. But that's just a common practice that everybody does, where our idea of a good life, and hence who we are and what we pursue and desire, is just fabulous, yeah. and we don't know it. There's an enormous, enormous degree that, of personal affect that is experienced through the practice of shopping in a consumeristic environment. Notice that nobody sits and gives you some statements to be memorized, nor are there any norms or principles that are verbalized. There's no such thing as, there's no nun sitting there forcing us to memorize anything and regurgitate it. You just know. You know what you're not supposed to wear. Right. <coughs> Nobody has to tell you, you know because people start looking at you funny. And the last thing we want to do is have people look at us funny. And we carry that baggage into our adulthood. I have got to be careful what I wear because I don't want to walk in there and have people looking at me. It's ingrained in us. It's driven in us. And some of us have already decided and accepted that we don't fit, so we're not even going to try. But we know what the norms are. We know what the expectations are without anybody sitting there making you learn and memorize it. Rather, these ideas are imparted through active immersion. That is to say that we're forced to interact with a culture or subculture that holds certain teleological standards, and by engaging in the normal practices of that world, we naturally adopt the messages of that teleos as our own. Referring back to Matthew 6, the Bible verse we dealt with before, where your heart is, or where your treasures are, there your heart is. Each person learns through ritual liturgical action where their respective culture has decided that the treasures are to be found. Let me go back and pull that verse again. I'm not very good at just memorizing stuff. Don't store up treasure where you don't store up treasures on earth where the moths eat them and rust destroys them, and where thieves break in the steel. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy it and thieves do not break in the steel. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. And another, what we just found out is that our cultures and our environments tell us where our treasures are supposed to be in their version of the good life. Yeah. These standards of what kind of shoes indicate a good life or what brand of purse indicates status are never explicitly defined or stated, yet we observe them, analyze them, and embrace or dismiss them without thinking a single discernible thought. We stack our wardrobe or the type of car we drive against what contemporaries model on the job, in schools, at restaurants, and at birthday parties, and make evaluations not just on the clothing of the vehicles, but about ourselves, our lives, and where we fall within their image of the good life that we've absorbed. In other words, we, don't, we, we go out and we absorb these messages. We see what everybody else is wearing, and we see what everybody else has. And we don't just evaluate what we have in our closet. It's not just, my shoes are outdated. I'm outdated. We evaluate not just the stuff, but who we are and where we are within the picture of the good life based on what we see everybody else with. While we engage in a rather in-depth exposition of the shopping culture or consumerism, it's not, that's not the only culture that has such deeply effective practices and images. We go shopping, some of us, once a month, twice a month, somebody goes shopping every weekend, whatever your ritual is. How much time do you spend listening to the radio? How much time do you spend watching the news? How much time do you spend listening to uh, music? How much time do you spend watching music videos? All of which have something that they're portraying to you. 
as what a good life looks like. You have political pundits telling you what social values are supposed to be. You have political candidates telling you what a good life is supposed to be. We have all of these cultures that converge, shaping us, telling us, feeding us an idea of a good life. And that has nothing to do with our personal experience. These are things that are universal to everybody. The artistic culture, the deaf culture, game culture, pop culture, LGBTQ culture, Wall Street culture, political culture, the culture of the ghetto or the projects, the culture of Hollywood and Beverly Hills, all communicate to its inhabitants ideas of what a good life looks like and mechanisms for pursuing that good life. There is no manual to study for any of these, yet the participants know who they are, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable as far as values and behaviors, as well as what they want out of life as a product of their experiences in those cultures. So tying this back into destructive behaviors and differing perspectives on what a good life looks like. When you're wondering what in the world that fool is thinking, and he may use some other more colorful words to describe that person whose life is going, Lord knows where. All of these things. It doesn't excuse it, but if you want to understand it and see where they're coming from, you have to look at where they've been and what factors affect. Why is he still sleeping in his mama's basement at 45 years old, at 50 years old? Why is he sleeping on this on his girl's couch at 30 years old with, on, on his girl's couch with no job? There's a whole, it, it, no, it's not healthy, no, it's not okay, no, it's not realistic, but there's a whole litany of things that feed into it that make them think, okay, well, this is the best life has. This is the good life for me. I'm being taken care of by somebody I don't need anything, and so the whole, I'm gonna get up, go make, make do on myself. I'm 22 years old, I'm 23 years old, I'm not looking for a job or not. I've got these, and this is, this is life. This is the best that life has. For me at this point, this is the best I can do. And we'll talk some more about some of that as we move on next week. Or not next week, but next month, because that's the next meeting we have. How are we doing time? Okay, I'm gonna do, I wanted to break into groups and have a discussion of small, in <coughs> smaller groups, but we're just gonna kind of deal with this as a collective. Prayerfully, as we work through this discourse, we're finding a better understanding of the world we live in, the people we encounter, and the choices that they make. Even more importantly, we hope that this process provokes each of us to consider our own persons, where we are in life, how we got here, and where we would like to be. So we, we're covering a lot of different stuff, but hopefully over the course of this, there's some illumination of people we know, people that we're involved in, and some exposition or some interrogation of ourselves and our own person and what drives us and who we are and where we're at. Hopefully, along these discussions, we have asked ourselves at some point in time, what do I consider a good life? And where do I get these ideas? It's perfectly acceptable and normal not to have found the answer yet to these questions, but it is imperative for the sake of spiritual development to give these issues consider consideration to help facilitate that and perhaps model such an inquiry. We're, we're going to ask some questions and discuss a few things as time permits us to deal with some of this stuff. Some of it is very simple and some of it is a lot heavier. And nobody's obligated to answer, and I don't know is a perfectly acceptable answer. Yet, I want to encourage everybody to think about these questions throughout the week. First thing we have, and this should be easy for some of y'all, what do you think, uh, yeah, what makes for a good video game? What makes a video game a good video game? That's look nice, the graphics. Okay. It needs to have an interesting story. <coughs> that people like, that likes different things. Um, it needs to be interesting. It needs to be able to keep someone's attention for more than at least 20 hours. So, more than 20 hours. It needs to be, <laughs> it needs to be long, too. So that it takes time to beat it. Okay. Like breeze right there. How about difficulty? Do you want to breeze through or do you want to challenge? Challenge. You want dark souls? You want dark souls? Okay. Why, do, why do you want dark souls? Okay. <laughs> you could, you know, play some baby stuff, play some of this for you. Or you could take your hands, pick up the control, and dip yourself inside the board of dark souls, where you're going to make them safe. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. A lot. You're going to. There's a lady in the game. You're gonna lose your soul over and over again. 
you're gonna you're gonna die a lot. You can be good, but you gotta go through all that stuff. That's what people say. I uh, I actually watched Uncharted uh, Four on YouTube, and the graphics were good. The story was long. It was interesting. I I maybe would not get it because uh -huh. I don't like the uh, Uncharted. But it was pretty good, and I, if it was a better game, like, I don't know, had more of a multiplayer kind of mm -hmm. type to it, I would get it done. What is this? Video games. Oh. There's a whole world. Right. You saw the light, you saw the lights turn on right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me move. Zelda. Legend. Which one? All of them. All of them. Zelda. If you don't know what the legend is, then it is to pray for you. <laughs> let me, I said, if you don't know what the legend is, then it is going to pray for you. All right, let me jump around here a little bit. Uh, Glenn, what makes a good job? And what do you think makes for a good job? Um, well, it depends on the person. Some people like... No, you. Oh, okay. Me? Something that, like, I can actually work with interactively, and it's not going to be, like, super boring. And I'm going to get paid to do it. Because and benefits? Paid how much? What did you say? Benefits. So that's over average? What's average? That's like minimum wage. Minimum wage is minimum. Minimum wage is an average. Yeah, but mm. why is everybody broke? <laughs> because they spend it more than they get it. What makes a good job? Something's not going to be ah, yeah. broke. Mm -hmm. much. Something's not going to be broke. What's broke? Broke is like, I can't do this. I can't. Well, I mean, I'm not broke, not but I can do a lot of stuff. Not necessarily, right. you can't do something you want to do, but you can't do something you need to do. You can't do something. Like well, what makes a good job? I think what makes a job great is doing something you love and being able to live on it. Whatever that is. Yeah, like I mean, for you, what makes a good job? I don't have it. You don't have it? No. no. But I do have a job that was, I work with great people. Okay. And I make a very good living. But it's not something, if I had my choice, I could give it up tomorrow. If, I, if someone job? said they weren't going to pay, say they told me tomorrow, hey, we're not going to pay you for this, or we're going to chop you down, I'd, I'd go look for something else. So I don't have, two out of three is, the first thing is if it's something you love doing. Second is that you work with great people. Third is you can make a good living doing it. So I have two out of the three. Okay. Where did benefits come up? What about the well, that's that's I, I throw that in with the money and everything, oh, okay. like good health insurance. And all. Oh, well, I have all that. It, it's oh, I'm not kidding you. It's a life changer. I work for the post office, and the post office is in a bad place. So I'm talking about how I feel. It's mm. post office is a great place. I work with great if you people. Get in. Sorry, I have to go yeah. It's hard to get in yeah. post office. But it, it, and now, it, yeah, it's really tough because we're uh -huh. downsizing. But I mean, forever. it it's something that allows you. If you're a single man, it allows you to think about starting a family, to do a lot of things that you couldn't think about doing before. If you're a married man, was when I got into it, it's, it's a whole dynamic. It changes you from working class to middle class to upper middle class. And, and you know, over a period of time, it just, it's something else. So you're talking so, about mobility. Yeah. Yeah. And, you can, and you have a time, like my wife and I went to trips to Hawaii. Right. We could have done that where I was working before. I don't care if I would have stayed there. You know, I don't know. I'll tell you what makes a great job. Okay. Um, yeah, CSCA, you know, they're doing all this, and then you get that good, you get a job, and then you just all you really get right there. So that's, that makes it, it gratifies you. The gratification. Satisfaction. Yeah, satisfaction of the work, and you know you're. I think that's child support, unfortunately, just <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant, child support, right. It's. Oh, wow. Yeah, if you, if anyone has that, and yeah. things like that, yeah. It's um, you, you feel very gratified, you know, through the evaluations that you're handling your business, and yeah, no. um, you know, that yeah. sounds yeah. yeah. From how much is, have a, um, what qualifies as an expensive haircut right. or hairstyle? One hundred dollars. One hundred dollars is an expensive hairstyle. Yes. <laughs> I feel like thirty. But have dollars. you paid? Hold on. What you say? I feel like thirty dollars is an expensive. Yes. For a guy, it's but for a good haircut. For, for a lady, yeah. it's different. Like oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, for a guy, for a girl. Yo, really? Haircut or hairstyle? Haircut, hairstyle. There is a difference from hairstyle. Yeah, hairstyle. 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 H
So it's somebody just who spends three nails, one hundred twenty-five. I wish somebody would cut my hair like a hundred dollars. You reckon? Just like the video game and the job you want to compare the experience of all of them all together, no matter what the hair style is. You can get them to get hair out, and I can go get a five-dollar razor and do my thing. And, but it's not gonna matter if I can't compare it against. There, that's not my good life. That's your good life. It's not my good job. That's your good job. Because to me, a good job can consist of making minimum wage, and I like going there, and I enjoy the experience of a good relationship with another person. Like I quote ahead, a good woman is hard to find. But once you find it, oh my God. So it's the experience of it all, not just that video game. Because I mean, you can get that video game, but. You are compared to how everybody else enjoyed it. Hey, how did you enjoy that? Mm -hmm. Oh, for me it was rocking. I thought it was challenging. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a, that brings up a good point. Mm -hmm. Yaris, where did you get your idea for what makes for a good video game? From my experience of playing all the video games that I've been playing. Okay. Hey, so that's cool. what developed something. Where'd you get your idea of a good job? Hey, <clears throat> having the jobs that I've before. I like working with that. Because when I was working with that, it's like, Working with that, right? So it's, I'm doing something I like doing. So it's not necessarily. It wasn't like a job. It was kind of like, like hobbies. So experiences you've had working with your dad, experiences you've had going through video games. Where'd you get your idea of what an expensive haircut is? Experiences, different shops. Different. Kind of different. Finding out what other people pay for stuff. Well, what I paid, um, having the same thing done. Okay. Peyton. Riley. Riley. What makes for a good dad? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Somebody who cares about you gets what you need. What's your idea of a good dad? Since you spoke up. <laughs> I don't know. Just call my dad. Go ahead. Oh, somebody was there. Uh, <laughs> well. You know, well, you got a mama daddy. Where'd you get your idea of what a good daddy is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, mama daddy right there. Hmm. From your dad? That's <laughs> awesome. Where'd you get your idea of what a good daddy is? <laughs> Carla, what makes for a good dad? <laughs> Someone who loves you unconditionally, who yes. understands you, who's there for you, no matter what. Um, Step to the line with you. Listen to you. Yep. Give you advice and not expect you to fight to do what they would want you to do or what they have done. Where'd you get your idea of what a good dad is? My dad. From your dad? Mm -hmm. Okay. Taught me what I didn't want. Taught you what you didn't want. Mm -hmm. So your image of a good dad comes from the opposite of what you experienced. Right. I had a good dad. Not a good dad? Yes. Everybody wanted my dad to be there. <laughs> Everybody's scared of my dad. scared of yours? All my friends are scared of Really? Good. <laughs> Curly's, what makes you a good wife? Um, loyalty. Loyalty? And support. And yeah, all of the above. You agree? So what'd you get your idea of where, what makes for a good wife? My wife. Oh, because I've been one. Hmm? Because I've been one. You've been one? Mm -hmm. Where'd you get your idea before that of what being a wife My looks like? My grandmother. From your mother? Grandmother. Grandmother. I think I'll take that drink now. That's it. I'm not sure what that being, means, but okay. Oh. Pardon me? You got an idea of being a good wife from your grandmother. Right. Coffee, of course. Coffee. You said you're looking for a good woman. She's a good wife. <laughs> <laughs> what's, your idea, what's your idea of what you're doing? Or what 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 makes you think that's Okay. So what's your what's your get your idea of what a good one next? Experience. Experience? Reason I'm asking these questions and want you to think about these things, especially as it pertains to relationships. What does we have all these relationships. What what is a, what is a good friend? I haven't picked on you yet. What makes for a good friend? Change. Someone that doesn't steal your stuff. Somebody that doesn't steal your stuff. That's a whole lot of people. 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 That's a whole lot of people.
Move your paper because you can't understand it through paper. Somebody gets loyal. And what'd you get to your idea of a good friend? So you got you know some people. Right, let's stretch it. Delisa, what does loyalty look like? Somebody that is in your corner, doesn't talk behind behind your back, who is a help, even if it's just a ear to ear. Is that something that you've experienced or something that you look for other people, or what you come up with that idea? Well, both. Uh, I have experienced it, and I'm still looking for it. Okay, hey, you had your hand up? Riley. Riley, Riley. <laughs> um, someone who doesn't care about who you actually are, like what you look like, instead of what's on the inside. Okay. Or someone who is there for you no matter what. Like instead of, the if the police get you, you're, they're not going to be like, I don't know her. <laughs> so we went through this process of asking these questions because it's important not only to know what we think is a good life, but also where we derive these ideas. What does a good life look like? How do I, what does having a good mother look like? Is a good mother somebody who always has something nice to say to you, and always has your back, and is always there supportive, or a good mother somebody who will come and smack you upside your head when you smack upside your head and and tell you when you trip it up, or is it both? both. Or is it neither? Both. Some people both. have never gotten whooped in their entire life and think that a good parent is somebody who never whooped you. Mm -hmm. Other people spent the majority of their childhood getting whooped mm -hmm. <laughs> and think that if you're not getting whooped by somebody, they're doing something wrong. Y'all thought that. I was a good kid. That's, you know, that's what y'all people always say, and I don't believe it. You just didn't get caught. Well, yeah, well, that's true. But that response, what I just said there, and you tripped into it, very beautiful. <laughs> One of the things that we're going to talk about. I wasn't the best kid, but I was a runner. I'm very fast. Very fast. And I came very fast. Well. Couldn't, couldn't get a hold of me. Yeah. Couldn't get a hold of me, no. Good. But you had to come back home. Skills. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. My brothers were fast. One of the things that we're going to do. No, did they? Okay. Yeah. You know, after a certain yeah. point, you just realize, I may as well just accept my fate. Yeah. Pictures of family, pictures that impress upon us. You get different categories of people from different experiences. That you got healthy, unhealthy, someone. Know. The people that came up in healthy families don't believe the experiences of the people that came from the unhealthy families. They're crushed by it. They cry when they hear what some of those folks want. The people that come from healthy families get ticked off and swear that the person from the healthy family is lying. When they hear about what a healthy family looks like and what they experience, I didn't say healthy. I know. I'm just. I, I'm, I'm stretching. I'm, I, I'm, I'm drawing a line from. I didn't get a whooping. I got all kinds of whoopings. To somebody says, me and my parents got along my entire life. Where does that happen? Yeah. Hardly ever. It, it's difficult to believe. My mother. My, my mother was my best friend my whole life. What? I, I don't think that my mother will be shocked to find out that that was not necessarily our story. <laughs> we got there for, uh, eventually, and then I met my wife. But for, you know, you know what kind of relationship we had. It was very adversarial, but we got to where we are now. So if somebody says, my mother's always been my best friend, I'm looking at them like, your mom ain't doing something right. Because <laughs> that's not normal. <laughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> But we're gonna we're gonna get there. I want you to start thinking about it, and we're gonna start eventually to get there. And I'm gonna wrap this up. We've gone long, but I hope it was entertaining for you all. And, and I think we're gonna get down to a question and start to analyze a question. Am I experiencing a good life? And if not, why not? And I can't answer that, but we can certainly examine it and deal with a lot of different issues. Mm -hmm. Am I experiencing a good life? And if I'm not, why why not? One of the things that I want to encourage you, I gave you the assignment a few weeks ago, and I thought, think that that was pretty instructive. I don't know that we're going to get there next week, but Hebrews 11, the entire chapter, most people know like the first three verses. But Hebrews 11, I want you to try to read throughout the week as we, you know, we're off for two weeks. The next time we meet is going to be October 7th. 
and we're going to talk about what happens when a dream is deferred. It's a Langston Hughes poem, but there's something very there's something that happens to us. One of the reasons that some people don't have a good life is because they've gone for a long time trying to get there and gave up on it. For whatever reason, everybody's got a story. But we're not where we think we could, if, if we could have gone back to a time of, that we were more innocent and less jaded, we can almost remember what we would have wanted out of life had things not gone a certain way. And the memories of that can be very difficult to deal with and very difficult to judge up. And the memories of the path that we came through are, can be difficult. What happens to us when we find out that our life, or when we realize that it's not the good life, but it's the best life I can have? How, how do those things become compromised? Am I living a good Because Christ says, I come that you have life and that you have it more abundantly, and we are, well, this is the best life I can get. That's, there's, there, there's a disconnect there. And this, this is kind of where this whole thing has been leading up to. What happens, and we're gonna do, what happens when we, find, when we think about or we struggle to get there and find ourselves constantly not getting there and have to settle into something else? What does it do to us? What happens to a dream before? What is the cost of that? Um, so that's where we're going to be jumping off on October 